Hello and welcome to New Filmmakers Los Angeles in partnership with Movie Maker Magazine. My name is Danny DeLillo and we're here at the South Park Center and I'm here with DP Carson with his movie Joe Frank, Somewhere Out There. Let's take a look at the clip. Joe Frank is what radio in its wildest dreams wishes it could be. Ballsy, intelligent, thoughtful, dangerous. I've drunk gallons of Chablis, danced the samba. I've sat outside the casino in Monte Carlo in the hours between closing time and dawn to listen to the shots of suicides. I have something going on inside me that all affected the way my radio programs developed. In a way, the absurdity came from the life I was leading. Uh, congratulations on your film, Dave. It's amazing. Thank you. Really fantastic. Um, but for those that haven't seen your film, tell us a brief synopsis. Well, Joe Frank is a cult radio personality who's done almost four decades of uh, work in mostly public radio. He did the most of his work out here in, in California at Santa mm -hmm. Monica at uh, KCRW. So mm -hmm. this is sort of a documentary portrait of him, feature length, uh, about his tripped out, you know, life and career and all the different types of shows he does. So. And how, how did you get involved or where did you inspired to make this particular Well, project? I listened to Joe back in 88 when I was in film school at Columbia College in mm -hmm. Chicago. And I used to listen to him and this guy named Ken Nordine who had this show called Word Jazz. And they were mm -hmm. on late at night. Ken kind of did this tripped out beat poetry. And then Joe would come on for the next hour and do his thing. Mm -hmm. And so I became a fan first through him. And Joe does some really interesting stuff with sound design, which I think as a listener I really, you know, was gravitated to. Plus he... Um, uh, he did these sort of heady philosophical monologues and mm. stuff, which when I was younger were very appealing, and they still are yeah. now. But later he came through Chicago in 2003 and got a Lifetime Achievement Award at the Third Coast Audio Festival. And I reached out to him to, to videotape a live performance he was doing there, which was kind of rare. And it was through that first uh, meeting, and then later when he did a show at Steppenwolf in Chicago, that was sort of the, you know, how this documentary started. Yeah, I mean, he's... He is some fascinating guy, um, and I feel like he's his his whole style is, is it's like he turns radio into an art form. It's like quite quite something else. Um, now, obviously, the documentary really showcases like his inspirations and where it all came about, and obviously what's happened span over the four decades. Um, what was it like for you as a filmmaker, sort of saying, "Hey, would you like to make this feature documentary about you?" And kind of what was his reaction t to that? Um, you know, I think it took a while to get him on board, but when he allowed me to sort of get into his life, he, the doors opened, and everybody that was sort of affiliated with Joe over the years, whether it was his friends and associates or whatever, they were all kind of dying to talk about him. Mm -hmm. So for me, it was a real treat just as a fan first to go and meet all these people who I'd heard through the programs and go and find Joe's old childhood mm -hmm. home and go to New York and go to L.A. whenever I could and shoot these different sequences with people. So. Mm -hmm. Um, not that there was a lot of detective work, but there was a lot of unfolding of the story by, by meeting all these people and hearing them tell you know, mm -hmm. their unique sort of portrait that they had on Joe. And I, I love the fact you had these sort of, um, you know, almost the documentary style was very much in, I imagine if he was making a documentary, it would be his style as well, like, you know, which I, I really, was there certain elements you wanted to kind of incorporate in this documentary particularly that kind of resembled his character? Well, I think what you're getting at too is like, when you do a film about a radio guy, what kind of visuals do you do? Because yeah. it's all about what, you know, you're hearing in your mind when you listen to Joe. Mm -hmm. So the challenge for me was to try to find the right B-roll, you know, mm -hmm. to go with all the stuff. So whether it was uh, waveforms, radio iconography. I loved all that, yeah. Yeah, um, you know, vintage stills of him. Yeah. Um, you know, going to his, the places where he came from, the cities that he that he walked around in, and, uh, and trying to not get in the way of Joe's radio shows. Because when I pull these selects, the last thing you want to do is make the viewer think too hard. Like, what am yeah. I looking at and what am I hearing? And so you have to sort of create these, these impressionistic sort of scenes mm -hmm. for people to sort of go with the flow. He, I mean, honestly, he has, for those that haven't seen it, he has one of the most captivating voices yeah. like I've ever heard, like really quite something else. Um, and, you know, he's, he's so, he just really allows you, really takes you to the depth of thinking um, beyond your brain, the brain capacity that we would normally have in everyday life, which I loved. Do you think in your experience, I mean, you obviously you're a fan of his, so it's different, but do you think he knows how great he is or in what he does? You know, I think, I think he 
um, he worked very hard on his scripts that he mm -hmm. wrote. I mean, he would do, when he got was cooking with gas at KCRW, he'd do a script a week uh, with all the different elements he used, you know, music he'd choose, um, high-end production values. And, and in the beginning, a lot of it was analog. I mean, it was not mm -hmm. digital. Yeah. It, was, it wasn't sitting down and doing a podcast with a mic. It was writing stuff, gathering the elements, going to a radio station, putting it down on tape, mm -hmm. um, and then recording it and getting it on the air by Saturday or Sunday, and then taking a day off and getting back to work. Mm -hmm. So, um, I guess for me, you know, I think he he knew how good he was, I think, you mm. know, because he put in the work. But what I talk about in the movie, which I, which was one of the reasons I really wanted to make the movie, because he told me this when I first met him at the Art Institute, was that he lived vicariously through one of his best friends, this guy named Peter, mm. that he grew up with. And Peter ended up living a life of great adventure and stuff like that, whereas Joe became kind of a studio rat mm. and never really went out and lived a life. Mm. So a lot of times when you hear Joe talking, he was talking about his friend Peter. Mm. So he was sort of a cat who um, didn't get out in the world much. So as much as he had this greatness in him, this art, he also, I think his life might have been a touch out of balance or something. Yeah, you know? yeah, interesting. So that, that, that was really appealing to me. Just, you know, and telling that story about how artists can look really great, but what are they sacrificing along the way to get there? That, uh, yeah, I think it's, it's, a, it's a great motto for life right there for any artist out there. Um, now, obviously, this was had multiple, lo you know, locations. You traveled to sort of, you know, hear from these different people, uh, which I'm sure was a challenge in itself. Um, what was the biggest challenge that you faced in making this documentary? Well, I self-financed it. I mean, uh, along the way, I had to, you know, pull money together to get out and do all this stuff. And as much as I own a camera and I have an editing system, there's a point where you have to get it into post-production mm -hmm. and put the patina on it, you know, to make it look great mm -hmm. and, you know, pay for all the hard costs along the way that you can't, you know, get for free or get discounted. And so um, the challenge was that and also working with Joe creatively because he, he passed away this year. Mm. Um, he, he was able to see the, the final cut of the movie uh, in uh, 2017, but then he died. Um, at the top of 2018. So what a great legacy you've, you've left with him with this oh. beautiful documentary. Thank um, you. So really that was a challenge, working yeah. with him to get the film done, but then also financing it along the way. And right mm -hmm. now it's still difficult because as much as I've cleared music rights, because a big part of Joe's shows are the music that he chose and used behind his monologues. Now that yeah. stuff I've got to pay for. So yeah. you know, I cleared the festival stuff, but now I've got to clear the distribution stuff. And that's like a $75,000 price tag. So yeah. that's for me trying to find a distributor who can help me with that or find somebody who wants to climb on board you know, as a producer mm. so I can get it out there. Um, there's people who are interested in getting this out in front of people next year. So well, I mean, I mean, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's such a wonderful legacy of his work and his life. I think one thing that we sort of, you know, maybe not appreciate as much is that, you know, radio over the course of four decades has really changed a lot. Um, you know, and he's obviously really moved with those times in the, f you know, for 40 years or so that of what he's been as a, as a, a you know, as a, as a producer in this area. Um, what was it like showcasing a new film because LA in front of a new audience and, you know, kind of really taking people into the journey of his life and, 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 and experiences that may, they may not have heard of this guy or they may have known about him and having that, what was kind of that been experience so far taking different festivals? Well, this new filmmakers in particular in Los Angeles was a very important screening because mm. a lot of Joe's friends and family and collaborators are from LA, plus mm. his largest audience is from this area. It kind of goes LA, Chicago, New York. And uh, so there were people who were dying to see this movie. And there's probably mm. people watching this show now going, you know, shoot, I missed it, you know? And yeah. I'm sorry for that. You know, I, I did try to hit up every media for like yeah. two months, <laughs> literally. But, uh, and, but and, and, and the only so much word gets out there if they don't know that it's out there. But so la uh, last night when we uh, played the film, it had a great response. It was a great buzz. I mean, it was, it's wonderful as a filmmaker to stand in the back of the room and feel every beat that you thought was going to work actually mm -hmm. worked because the people who were around here were very savvy about Joe. So yeah. they understood the nuance of everything that I thought I was putting in the film. So it was very cool. But mm. again, you know, I, I thank you guys for, oh. for helping me out because uh, I don't take this stuff for granted. You know, I've been around 30 years doing this stuff, so I understand you know, how hard it is to get films in front of audiences, so it, I appreciate it. it. Oh, no, I mean, we're, we're, we're grateful for this story, and I think it's also really important to sort of know of these amazing people that have really, you know, changed the force of radio and influenced many people's lives, and I think that's such a powerful thing, and, and I think it's the most beautiful legacy to leave this amazing documentary, you know, in, in the sad year that he passed away for his friends and family and all of his supporters as well. I think it's amazing. Um, what's next for you? Oh, I, I might try to get back to narrative, you know. Yep. Um, I've got a few scripts I've pushed around over the years. One of them was, I used to be a grave digger when I was saving money to get back to film school back mm -hmm. in my teens and early 20s. So there's a story about that and other things that I've put on the shelf. I'm kind of, yeah. I've done a lot of films with people 
with other artists about creative process. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think I've, I've done enough of that. I'll be a little more introspective now about my own life. Well, in your, in your 30 years of experience, what a piece of advice do you have any filmmaker out there yeah. that wants to go make that project? You have to be, you've heard it before, but you have to be passionate about that subject. Mm -hmm. Because I think this, this thing in, in, in the end is a very abusive kind of role to take on as a director. I mean, mm -hmm. there's, you have to fight through so much stuff, I think, um, to get your vision out there or whatever it is you're trying to do. You know, and also just understand that there's a film you think of, the film you make, and the film you end up with. That's kind of what my film fetus company is about, you know, this evolutionary process of, mm -hmm. of a movie. You have to understand that. You have to sort of work with it. At some point, it's not my film. It's the film's film, mm -hmm. you know, and it starts to show itself. So I think I've learned that over the years. You don't fight these things. You sort of organically work with it as they go. Well, I mean, DP, thank you very much for, for sharing this film with us. And um, I advise everyone to go and see Joe Frank somewhere out there because it's really inspirational. And, yeah. uh, and what I love about it, it's what became your passion will become other people's passions as well and, and hopefully discover his work. So looking forward to much more of your work, DP. Thank yeah, you very much. Yeah, sounds good. If people want to check it out, joefrankmovie.com. Fantastic. Thank you.